Hi, I'm Adam Koonsmiller here with RPG Geek at Gen Con 2013, and I'm joined by Jay Little, designer of X-Wing and the Star Wars role-playing system from FFG. Jay, why don't you tell us what we have here? Well, I'm really excited, uh, especially about the role-playing system, because we were able to capture a narrative system driven by dice that allow people to add details to the story in a really organic and natural way. Uh, it uses a number of different unique dice that are staged and have each each of the type of die has a different reason for being rolled, so you actually know how it impacts the narrative and the results of a particular die. For example, there are these uh, boost and setback die. The blue boost dice are good and the black setback die are bad. Uh, they replace dozens of charts and tables that a lot of games might have for plus one to that, minus two for this. Instead, it's as simple as, oh, do you have an advantage? Let's say you're hiding behind cover. Or is there a disadvantage? It's raining or you have unsteady aim. They very, very quickly allow the GM and the players to simply modify the situation based on how they've already been describing it. Uh, the narrative dice also have a number of symbols on them that allow them to contribute to several different ways of resolving a task. It's not just as simple as yes, no. Sure. Nothing really happens that easily. The part about this that I'm especially proud of is the fact that there are several different ways that something can result in, such as a success with a complication, or maybe a failure with a silver lining. And a good example of that might be a success, uh, you're trying to fire at a stormtrooper and you succeed in hitting them, but there's a complication in that uh, maybe the blowback on the weapon knocked you prone, or maybe you have to reload, or maybe you opened up yourself to fire from somebody else. Sure. There's just really a lot of flexibility in the system. And uh, one of the things that I think people are really enjoying is that this same system fuels both Edge of the Empire, which was the first in the series that we released. It's about the scum and villainy and Han and Chewie and bounty hunters sure. and the very fringes of society. But then there's also Age of Rebellion, which we've debuted this year with the beta, which is more of the struggle of the rebellion against the Empire. It uses the same disc the same dice, the same system, the same mechanics throughout. Really the only difference is a lot of the fluff and background so you can really feel part of that and an element that ties these stories to their settings. For example, Edge of the Empire has something called obligation. Mm -hmm. Everybody owes somebody something. Sure. Han owes a big debt to Jabba and that's represented by obligation in the game so it's a motivator. I'm going on my adventures and I am going to uh, evaluate these resources and situations based on who I owe and what I owe to them. For Age of Rebellion, instead of obligation, we came up with the idea of a duty or responsibility that these characters have toward the rebellion. They have opportunities to show themselves and raise their status. One person might be wanting to intercept communiques, another one is trying to perform uh, military strikes, while somebody else is trying to sway these uh, different races, councils, or political entities to support and back the rebellion. So it's really exciting that both of these systems are completely interchangeable and you can take a character from one and put them right alongside the other. Oh, great. They're balanced, they use the same mechanics, but they still might have different motivations throughout the process of the game. Sure, that sounds great. And uh, I know one thing that people often wonder about Star Wars games is what in this system prevents everyone from just wanting to do force things all the time? How do you be a rogue and still be effective? Right, well I think it's r really easy to just look at the movies and see that Han does not take a back seat to sure. Luke. Even while Luke is in training and he's starting to become more and more sensitive to the force and gain power uh, and control over those powers, there are a lot of interesting specializations. The game is tried to be as organic as possible so a player can build whatever kind of character he wants that would appear in this edge or this age of rebellion setting. A lot of it is all about risk and reward. What are you willing to pay to get what you want? For example, a diplomat might want to increase his wound threshold so he can withstand more damage in combat, but for him to increase it, it might cost 20 experience points. Yeah. Meanwhile, the Wookiee Marauder, who is a big, strong, heavy melee combatant, it might only cost him five experience because that is part and tailored to sure. his career and his specialization. So even though you have these two talents that are identical, the cost is different. And I like to say that it kind of self and course corrects. If you want to pay that much and it's worth it to you, that diplomat might see value in those 20 XP for the health. Well, the Marauder's like five experience points for that. I'll find something else to do. I can take enough punishment. So there's a lot of uh, crossover and the ability to pick and choose and create a character that is dynamic and fills all the roles that you want. There's also some force sensitivity, but I think as people play Age of Rebellion and 
uh, Edge of the Empire, they're going to find that they've got these dynamic, exciting, rich characters that have abilities that really fit everywhere. Now, the Force is represented, but I think people are really going to be excited next year when we announce and release uh, Force of Destiny, which is going to be the third in this series. And I really just want people to understand that these are each independent product lines that are each going to be supported with their own supplements, but they are completely cross-compatible. You can take your smuggler from Edge of Rebellion and have him playing alongside a diplomat ambassador from uh, Age of Rebellion. I've also been calling them Edge of the Rebellion and Age of Empire simply because it's so easy to cross them over. So it sounds like uh, another, you mentioned spending experience in different yep. ways. So this is a system where characters kind of organically improve over time as opposed right. to ding, now I'm, you know, yep. this much better at all these things. There are no levels. Instead, I try to incorporate this concept that I really like called micro-feedback. That you are given small rewards more frequently to entice you to continue. It's kind of like unlocking achievements in a video game. Sure. You get a little bit of experience here and there that you can customize and some things cost very, very little. So, sure, I want to be a little bit better at this. Boom. I will find this one thing that is a weakness and shore it up. Or maybe I will bank my experience for that one big thing. But there are a lot of different resources in the game that players have at their disposal to be able to influence the story so it comes out the way they want their characters to uh, participate. Cool. And I notice these dice are kind of paired where you've got yep. a good and a bad that matches it. Yeah, it's kind of a yin-yang and a light and dark just like the force itself. So we've got setback and boost dice, which are the weakest, but they're also the ones more likely to be flexibly added based on the narrative. Then we have ability and difficulty dice, which are really the ones that form the, the core of a dice pool. And so when you attempt an action, you pull some dice together and then you roll them. Well, ability dice can be upgraded to these proficiency dice to show that you are especially skilled or trained in something, while these challenge dice are upgraded versions of difficulty dice and have especially bad consequences and results. So a good example of this is if you are facing uh, a stormtrooper, you might only be facing some of these purple difficulty dice. If you're facing a named character like maybe Darth Maul, things might be more challenging and there's an inherent risk in those confrontations. All right, great. Well, why don't we do just a really quick example here to show how this system works. So let's say I'm a bounty hunter sitting in a bar with an assassin across from me and yep. uh, I want to maybe shoot him under the table before he shoots me. Okay. How would we do that? That's a great example. So um, let's say that you really, really wanted your character to shoot first. Yes. Um, that's very important to my character. So the first thing that you would be doing is rolling for initiative, which is based on a characteristic either called vigilance if uh, you're surprised, if you're in ambush, if you weren't expecting it. However, you're in control here and you are trying to trigger this. So you would use what's called cool. It's how calm and collected can you stay? How uh, can you like not show off or give a tell on what's going sure. on? So first you would roll a cool check. Let's assume you've done that, and obviously since we want you to shoot first, obviously. you've rolled more successes. Next what you would be doing is making a, an attack with your blaster pistol, right. which is under ranged light. So let's, for argument's sake, say that you have two ranks of skill in ranged light, and that's based on your agility, which is a four. Four is the larger number, so we're going to take four of these green ability dice. Okay. And that's how we start. But you are skilled in blasters, so we're going to take out two of those green dice and replace them with proficiency dice oh, nice. to show how your skill works. I like it. Now, difficulty is something that basically defines just the core absolute difficulty of the task. For example, picking a lock. It doesn't matter who's picking the lock, it's the same lock. Well, here you're trying to shoot somebody at close range. Well, close range is only one die. It's an easy task. Okay. However, you are trying to quick draw without raising any suspicion. Right, so right. So I'm going to make that a little bit more difficult for you. And I'm going to spend, there are, there's another resource called Destiny that allows a player to spend something to increase his odds. As the GM, I have access to dark side. So I could spend a dark side Destiny point to increase the difficulty, knowing that if you fail, he's going to get a return shot off immediately. Great. If there are no other factors influencing this, we would go ahead and roll this pool of dice. So now we've figured this all out. We clear I... everything else out. We're going to roll these dice. And what's interesting about these dice is the symbols on them from the good dice are paired with the symbols on the bad dice to cancel each other out. This starburst on the green die, for example, is a success symbol. And this triangle on the red die is a failure. Uh, Failures and successes cancel each other out on a one-for-one -one basis. 
so these cancel each other out, we can kind of set them aside. He also rolled a super awesome, cool critical on the right. yellow expertise die called a triumph. And what's cool about that is not only does it count as a success, it also counts as a critical effect. So the core mechanic is after canceling success and failure, if you have at least one success showing, the task succeeds. Boom, you've got one success showing, you succeed. Finally, we look at other modifiers. Are there complications or other benefits along the way? And that is modified by threat, which is bad, and advantage, which is good. They cancel each other out as well. So one threat would cancel one of these advantage, and the final result is a success from the triumph, so he hits. Three advantage, so something good happens along the way, and a triumph allows a critical. It's almost as if we plan to roll this. So you get your fire off, it's a critical effect, you can uh, trigger the critical effect of your weapon, and with that many advantage, you could do something like quick holster your gun again so nobody, nobody saw even what you did. And I shot him in such a way that he just kind of slumps. He nobody slumps. even realizes he's been hit. Exactly. Now, you could have succeeded, but have a lot of threat showing instead. You still would have hit him, but maybe uh, it ricocheted, or maybe he still does get a, a shot off, sure. or screams out and it draws the attention of the guards. What I really like most about this is that you can have success tainted by complication or success with even better results and also failure with a silver lining like I mentioned sure. or a series of stack results it makes it very very dynamic and it's kind of like no two actions are resolved the same way. It also seems like with these custom dice it's really easy to bake in additional layers of interest on every check that you make so instead right. of saying I I beat my check by a lot of points and so now maybe something can happen it's as simple as I have these symbols in surplus yep. So now these extra effects take place. It's a resource at your disposal, but what I, another really cool benefit about this is it keeps it from feeling arbitrary. So if we had rolled just this and uh, one extra success, since a despair counts as a failure and that counts as success, they cancel each other out. One success left, you hit, but a despair is a very, very bad thing. But it doesn't cancel out a triumph. They all happen at the same time. So you hit, you do damage, but something goes wrong. Mm -hmm. Let's say your blaster misfires, now it's jammed. Well, if you had succeeded in a task in a lot of other role-playing games, it would feel like the GM is out to get you if all of a sudden something bad happened sure. when you yeah. succeeded. But here there's a lot of feedback available to really make those rich, interesting scenes that we've seen in the movies just really pop. All right, well, that sounds great. Let me just go ahead and show some of these books that we have here. Here's the, uh, the first game the yep. uh, Edge of the Empire, and then we have the the uh, the beta, which will be in the same format of this, but for early release, it has this uh, slightly different printing. Correct, and we've got the Edge of the Empire here right now. It's just beautiful. It's more than 400 pages, hardcover. It is uh, excellent, and the beta process that we use for Edge of the Empire dramatically improved the game. The, the fan base has been phenomenal. So we wanted to do the same thing with Age of Rebellion and give them an opportunity to make sure that it delivers the sort of experience that they've come to expect from Star Wars, pitting the rebellion against this tyrannical empire. All right, and that was Adam Kunzmiller and Jay Little yep. with the Star Wars role-playing game.